Okay, we're going to be today on page, <clears throat> starting on page 33. So today, we are talking about the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which was initiated in Vienna, Austria in 1969, and in the United States was actually entered into force in 1980. Um, so the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties essentially is a very important document for a number of reasons in international law. First of all, it is, we viewed the term last time, codification, that is writing up, putting into writing international law, customary rules, putting them into a written document. And the Vienna Convention really is uh, an embodiment of that whole idea of codification of customary international law. And sometimes it's called, if you look at the bottom of this page, sometimes this is called a treaty on treaties, which is kind of an interesting idea. So it's an agreement about agreements, right? Uh, now the reason why this is so important, this essentially is the ground rules for establishing, number one, how treaties are made, um, who has the power in a state to make a treaty, when are treaties ratified, when are parts of treaties valid or invalid, how can treaties be modified, what happens if uh, a country is not following the terms of a treaty, can other countries not follow it as well, and it really sets forth the ground rules for how treaties are created. And it sort of serves as the backdrop any time that there is diplomatic efforts to create a treaty, uh, sort of the idea being that we will rely upon as a background, the background rules, so to speak, the ground rules, like we would say in baseball or softball, the idea that this is, the we're going to go by the rules of the Vienna Convention as we engage in diplomatic treaty or convention um, formulation, negotiation, and whatnot. For me, one of the most important things about the Vienna Convention is it really puts into place, in pretty clear wording in a way, a lot of the basic rules of customary international law that we've been talking about that have developed over time, uh, including this whole idea of a peremptory norm as jus cogens, uh, and how that interplays with treaty law. <clears throat> So I just want to go through and, and show you some of the uh, relevant provisions. We're not going to go through every single article here. That would take us days. Uh, but just some of the, the interesting points or uh, important points, at least in my viewpoint. So at the very, begin, very beginning here, <clears throat> uh, for purposes of the present convention, this is under Article 2, Section 1, Subsection A. A treaty means an international agreement concluded between states. So I'm going to stop right there. So states, not other subunits. It has to be an international state. So the U.S. federal government, other uh, sovereign states at the state level, not lower level political units. Number two, in the same paragraph, in written form. So the Vienna Convention requires that a treaty be something other than a verbal agreement. Last time we talked about executive agreements whereby the president or other head of state may enter into an agreement, which we would call an executive agreement that really doesn't rise to the level of being a technical treaty. And this goes along with that idea in that a treaty must be in a written format, something other than a verbal agreement of some type. Um, now, theoretically, the states could agree to formalize a verbal agreement, but at the end of the day, there has to be a written document that embodies the treaty, as under the Vienna Convention rules. All right, letter B, we're on page 33. So Article 1, or excuse me, Article 2, Section 1, Letter B. Some of the different terms that we use in treaty law, 
We've talked about some of these already. So ratification, as we've talked about, the term ratification generally refers to the idea that the treaty has been approved within or accepted uh, by the, the states that are part of the treaty making negotiations and along with that, the treaty has been adopted under the formal internal law of whatever states are involved, either as a, as a self-executing treaty or a non-self-executing treaty, uh, but that term ratification. So we haven't really talked about this term, but it's a term I also want you to know, and that is the term ascension. This is basically a word that means that a state may join onto a pre-existing treaty even if they were not part of the original states that entered into the original negotiations to conclude and create the treaty to begin with, a state may accede or through the process of ascension join onto a treaty either in whole or sometimes they're allowed to join in part, that is agree to part of a treaty and not part of others, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, but that term ascension basically means to join onto a treaty or a convention after it's been put into force and already being honored by other states uh, after the fact. <clears throat> that may be by various reasons. It may be because it's a newly created state or it may be that they just haven't got to it yet or whatever the case may be. And then under the same subparagraph B, the purpose of a treaty is an acknowledgement whereby a state establishes on the international plane its consent to be bound. And again, I go back to this whole idea of what is sovereignty, kind of a theme again over and over. Sovereignty with international law, one of the reasons we say that treaties are the most important source of law is that it is proof of the agreement, the consent of a sovereign to be, to essentially limit its power by entering into a treaty. And that's why it's such powerful evidence of international law, because you have written proof that a state has agreed to the principles that are set forth in the treaty itself. Essentially, it's a contract. We've talked about that before. Just kind of on a side note, a lot of these rules that we see in the Vienna Convention are also rules that we use in contract law, in domestic law. So here in the United States, we have the Uniform Commercial Code, which is law that deals with how contracts are created in the business environment on a, you know, on a small scale, state level or uh, within the United States. We also have international treaties the United Nations Convention on International Sales, which is a law involving international contracts, which we'll talk about later in the term. But we see a lot of the same principles embodied in the Vienna Convention about treaty making that we do in contract law. Because really, at the end of the day, <clears throat> a treaty is a form of a contract between sovereign states. And again, this is codification that is putting these customary rules of contract law into a written form. That's why it's such an important document. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's move over to the next page here. So page 34, part two, section one, article six. Real basic, every state possesses capacity to conclude treaties. Now that's a very simple statement, very simple sentence, but behind that simple sentence there's a lot going on. Number one, this is the idea that a state, a sovereign, regardless of its size, it could be Costa Rica, it could be the United States, in terms of international law, all states have the legal authority to negotiate and enter into treaties, regardless of the size. So the idea behind that is back to this idea that on an international plane, one of the fundamental theories of international law, modern international law, is that all states are created equal, kind of like our equal protection ideas in the US Constitution. 
And as evidence of that, a state, by being a state, may enter into treaty law. Now, there's a subtext to that that's kind of important, which we'll get into more, I think, on Thursday. What is a state? How do you know if a geographical area is considered to be a state for international law purposes? And we're going to talk about, there's a four-part test under uh, the Montevideo rules. And so one of the ways that you look at whether or not a group of people, a territory, a geographical area, whatever you want, however you want to define it, is now considered, quote, unquote, a state, is if that group has entered into treaties. Because if that group, so let's, let's just say Oregon, for example. Let's say Oregon decided, you know what, we're going to be our own country. And so we have a boundary. We have a government within Oregon. We have a territory, a group of people within the, within the state, within the boundary. Now, under the Constitution of the U.S., Oregon can't do that. But theoretically, in international law, Oregon could secede from the United States, declare its independence, and be a separate country, theoretically. So the question then is, how do you tell, let's say Oregon, or this has happened throughout the world, how do you tell if that geographical area that now has said, declared itself to be a state, we're now independent, well, one of the ways you look at that on an international plane is if other states have entered into treaties with that newly formed state. And it's sort of a, it's called implied recognition. And that is the idea that if other states have entered into a treaty with this newly created state, then that is a way that other states have acknowledged that a geographical area now is considered an international state uh, at the international law level. So that's why that little sentence there is very important because there's a lot going on in the background. And, and we're going to talk about recognition of states uh, next class. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that much more than that. But um, the main point I want you to take out of this is one of the benefits of being a, benefits maybe not the right word, but one of the powers or benefits or whatever of being a state is the ability to enter into a treaty. That's one of the measuring ways we determine if it's in fact a state or not. Now, under the U.S. Constitution, Oregon does not have the authority to enter into treaties. That is solely reserved for the federal government. All right. So next under Article 7 is the idea of full powers. Now, I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot, but basically this whole Article 7 deals with who has the authority within a state to enter into a treaty. Now, the reason why this is important is, or can be important, is it may not be apparent sometimes if you have a turbulent political situation in a, in a geographical area, Maybe you have a prime minister, but you also have someone who's claiming to be a president, and internally they have turmoil. Uh, and so one of the issues that you have to look at, and this has been true throughout the ages, is who has the authority to enter into a treaty on behalf of a sovereign? Because once a sovereign enters into a treaty, it is bound by the treaty. So this sort of goes through just sort of a basic hierarchy of who has the basic authority to enter into a treaty. Now this will also depend upon inter internal domestic law to a degree. But obviously at the, t at the head or the very beginning, the head of state, the head of government, and ministers for foreign affairs essentially is the starting point. That's where you look to see who has authority. Next below that would be heads of diplomatic missions, which have been given the authority under domestic law to negotiate and carry forth the treaty. And then below that we have an accredited representative uh, to an international conference or international organization. So that would be, for example, uh, a representative of a country maybe at the World Trade Organization, 
that has been given authority to negotiate on behalf of a country at the WTO or at the United Nations or some other international organization uh, that may be involved in uh, convention or treaty making on the, on the, at the beginning. So that just sort of gives you that hierarchy. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but again, it's one of those ground rules of treaty law that's now embodied in the, the Vienna Convention. Let's go to page 37, and again, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump around a bit here. I just want to point a few things out, you know, the, the important parts that I want you guys to know about. Oh, I forgot to highlight this one. This is what I talked about earlier. All right, uh, Article 17, consent to be bound by part of a treaty. Um, essentially, this is a provision that allows for a state to be bound by only part of a treaty uh, so long as the other states agree to it. Uh, and that sometimes occurs, maybe there's a portion of a treaty that is relevant only to certain areas where that state has an interest and maybe they don't care about the rest of the treaty. Uh, so this does allow for that sort of fact. Now this will interplay with what we call a reservation. Uh, which we'll get to in just a moment under Article 23 or Section 2. Um, Article 18, kind of an interesting provision of obligation not to defeat the object and purpose of a treaty prior to its entry into force. A state is obliged to refrain from acts which defeat the object and purpose of a treaty when it has signed the treaty or exchanged instruments, documents, constituting its uh, or, uh, subject to ratification, acceptance, or approval internally, or has it expressed its consent to be bound? Now, this is kind of interesting, again, behind the scenes. So this paragraph is basically saying when a diplomat or an ambassador, or even the President of the United States for that matter, has expressed their intention to enter into a treaty, now, under the U.S., it still has to be confirmed by the Senate, right, to, in order to be ratified. Nevertheless, under that article, the state still is required to follow the terms of the treaty, even though domestically it hasn't yet been approved. Now, this is kind of interesting if you think about it, because this is sort of a way that even if a, and it may never be approved. You know, the Senate may never possibly approve a treaty. But theoretically, under this article then, a state still has to follow it. So this is a way of sort of creating backdoor customary law, at least between those states. Um, this is also a way that a state may be held to a treaty that has not yet been ratified at least on the international level. It would not be binding internally within a state until it's been ratified. But theoretically, a state on an international level, perhaps in the court of justice or in another tribunal, if they are violating an unratified treaty, they could still be held to the terms of the treaty uh, by the other states that are part of the treaty that is yet to be ratified. Boy, that's a tangle up mess of words, wouldn't it? <laughs> so what I'm saying here is this is kind of an interesting area, and this is just a, a, a beginning of this, one of the notions of the Vienna Convention that's interesting, back to what is the highest form of law? Is it really treaty law, or is it really customary law? And we see kind of a theme interwoven throughout the Vienna Convention that treaty law, in some cases is actually secondary to customary law and to the notion of good faith, that a country is required in good faith to carry out the agreements that they have made. Um, now I can't think of 
Well, actually, yeah, international law, maritime law, um, which has never fully been ratified in the U.S., but we still carry out a lot of the provisions of it, just be, as a matter of you know, have to, you know, navigational rules. Okay. Section 2, Article 19, reservations. <clears throat> First of all, what is a reservation? A reservation is when you're going to go on vacation and you book a hotel room. Oh, wait. So that's a joke, come on. We have treaty laws kind of stale, right? right. Truvala. A reservation is when a state either, uh, basically a state is saying, we agree to these parts of a treaty, but not to these parts. Either at the beginning of a treaty or later on, when a state is acceding or joining onto a treaty, a state may say, we will agree to everything except for this one particular paragraph or this one particular sentence, which we're not going to agree to. We're essentially going to write it out, cross it out. But we agree to everything else in the treaty. So that is the idea of a reservation. Now. If it's a bilateral treaty, that is only two countries, it's not that big a deal because you just renegotiate the treaty. Or you, at the beginning, if both sides agree to remove that language, then it's not a problem. The problem arises when you have multiple parties in a multilateral treaty, or you have countries acceding that are coming onto the treaty and joining at a later time, and a country may want to formulate or provide a reservation to parts of the treaty. So this whole section with the various articles, and it gets kind of detailed, but basically it goes into when does a country have the ability to validly make a reservation and when is a reservation invalid. So. These are the main ones I want you to know, and I do have a couple test questions that come out of this. Um, by the way, on both the quizzes and on the tests, it's pretty common for me to ask very, very specific questions. Like, for example, under Article 19 of the Vienna Convention, when is a reservation prohibited? And you're going to want to look, you know, pull it up. So when you take the quiz and the test, have your book available. Um, maybe put a little sticky note on some of these pages, that way you can just turn right to it. My tests are not timed, so you, know, you have plenty of time, um, but nevertheless. All right, so a reservation may be valid except when A, the reservation is prohibited by the treaty. That's pretty obvious. The treaty says we will not allow any reservations, it's either all or nothing. Either join the whole thing, or you don't join any of it. All or nothing. Or it may say, we will allow for certain types of reservations, but not others. So if the treaty expressly provides for it, that's a pretty easy one. Um, and then this next one here, uh, <clears throat> that's letter B I just talked about. Letter C, and this is probably the more important one. A reservation will be invalid if the reservation is incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty. Now, what does that mean? That means, essentially, you, you look at what is the main function or reason for the treaty. And if a reservation essentially wipes out the whole purpose of the treaty to begin with, then that reservation just as a matter of logic, would not be valid. So for example, maybe, and I'm just going to use this, probably not really a great example, but it's all I can think of. Maybe the treaty is for a ceasefire of hostilities. Basically, the treaty says that the parties will no longer engage in military force against each other. Instead, they will result, you know, resort to diplomatic activity instead of military activity. And one of the countries says, well, we'll agree to that, but we're still, we're going to reserve out and reserve the right to use missiles. I don't know, something like that. 
Well, that, that guts the whole tree. That guts the whole purpose of the tree. Or maybe it's an environmental tree that talks about limits of sulfur dioxide and diesel fuel. And the country says, well, we will agree to that except for that part of it. Well, that kind of guts the whole thing. So that makes sense that a reservation really cannot have the purpose of destroying the treaty to begin with. And again, we have that same rule in contract law, uh, and it makes obvious sense. Okay, under Article 23, next page over. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> a reservation must be formulated in writing and communicated the, to the contracting parties or other states which are entitled to become parties. So the reason I highlight that is this is again an embodiment of the idea that treaty law must be in writing and you don't have secret side deals going on. So if you're going to say we're not going to agree to parts of the treaty, that has to be made public, disclosed in a written document and provided and communicated to all the parties who may be affected. That way you don't have sort of under the table kind of side deals going on, which obviously happens all the time. Um, but in terms of treaty law, we want it to be in writing uh, for multiple multitude of reasons. And this is an embodiment of, if you're gonna make a reservation, it has to be written form. That way everybody can know about it and either agree to it or not agree to it. <clears throat> Now, as we work our way through the Vienna Convention, I'm not going to go through the rest of it, but with reservations, some of the other issues that come up that the Vienna Convention deals with is if you have a country that has made a reservation, which has been accepted by other countries, but some of the countries that are part of the treaty have not made that same reservation, then the reservation between the countries that have not made it is still binding between them, but not binding on the country that has. It gets kind of complicated. So you can actually have a treaty that may be partially binding on some of the countries, but not other ones. And that's, it has a little way of figuring out how that goes down. I'm not going to spend any time on that one. Um, let's go to page 39. Here's the term we looked at the other day, which I talked about just a few minutes ago. Pacta sunt servanda. Again, customary international law, also customary law in contract law. And this is true both in common law and civil law countries from a historical basis. And this is the phrase that just in a nutshell means that a party to a treaty must perform the obligations in good faith. Pacta sunt servanda, you have a, your agreements should be served. That's basically how that translates. So here it is written down, old customary international law. Okay, <clears throat> next page over. Treaties in third party states. So Article 34. <clears throat> I'm going to put a little star by this one. Very simple statement. A treaty does not create either obligations or rights for a third state without its consent. So what does that mean in plain language? That means if there's a treaty and there's a country that's not part of the treaty, that country is not bound by the treaty. Pretty obvious, right? Just like in contract law, if I'm not a party to a contract, I'm not bound by that contract. So if you have a contract between the two of you, I'm not part of that contract, like maybe your credit card bill, <laughs> that's a contract. I'm not obligated to pay the credit card bill if you default, unless I agree to it as a guarantor. Well, that's just obvious, right? 
So that's, again, a written embodiment of customary international law, which seems so obvious, but there are exceptions to that. <clears throat> and this is where it gets kind of interesting. Next page over. And again, I'm going to put a little star. And I want you to remember back a couple class sessions to Article 38 of the International Court of Justice. Here we have another Article 38. So we have two Article 38s in international law from different sources. The first one, which we've already looked at, I'm going to go back and show it to you in a minute again, is Article 38 of the International Court of Justice, which sets forth the sources of law that the court will look at, just as a reminder. Let's look at it right now. Hold on. So page 20. So Article 38 of the International Court of Justice, order of law, Conventions and treaties, international custom, general principles, judicial decisions, and academic. That's Article 38 of the International Court of Justice. This Article 38 of the International Court of Justice states that conventions and treaty law is the highest form of law internationally. Now I want to contrast that with Article 38 of the Vienna Convention. So back to page 41, Article 38 of the Vienna Convention. Nothing in Article 34 and 37 precludes a rule set forth in a treaty from becoming binding upon a third state as a customary rule of international law recognized as such. Now let me break that down for you. Nothing under Article 34 and 37. So let's go back a page, and I apologize for jumping around. Article 34, more so than Article 37. So we just said Article 34 means that a country that's not part of a treaty is not bound by it. And then Article 37 talks about the same idea, only on a modification. So if a treaty has been modified, a country that didn't agree to the modification is not bound by it. However, Article 38 seems to be, well, is an exception to that. So Article 34 says a country that's not part of a treaty is not bound by it. However, right here in Article 38, there is an exception that says that if a treaty is an embodiment, that is a written codification of customary international law, which is recognized as such, then potentially a third party state may be required to follow the treaty even if it's not a party to it. Now why is this so important? Under this article, and there are follow up ones which we'll look at in a moment, under that article, then, which really is the highest form of law? Is it really treaty law or is it customary law? Because if it says that a state must follow customary law even if it's not part of a treaty, then really customary law is still the highest form of law in a way, isn't it? This is a way that under the Vienna Convention, a state not party to a treaty may still be required to follow it. So that seems to totally be an opposite conflicting terms with Article 34 of the Vienna Convention. But also, doesn't that sort of also conflict with Article 38 of the International Court of Justice that says that treaty law is the number one source? Interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> Well, in some ways it does conflict, in some ways it does not. Um, and the reason why is this. There's a few reasons why. Number one, most customary law that's going to rise to that level 
is already going to be part of a convention or a treaty, just as a matter of time, through codification and whatnot, um, it, it will be part of a treaty in some form or the other. Number two, we go back to that whole idea of what really is customary international law. So we looked at the idea of a three mile range with a cannon defending your uh, offshore territory. We looked at the idea of ships having to turn right for navigational purposes. And we looked at the idea of the Sputnik satellite that was put up by the Soviet Union, creating a, a form of customary international law that outer space is free to all countries, open, as opposed to airspace. So this embodies that idea that customary law may still be the ultimate source of law because it's what states actually do. Even if they don't necessarily agree to it by treaty, that's what they actually practice. So I find that, I mean, for me personally, it's very interesting. Uh, so Article 38 of the Court of Justice and Article 38 of the Vienna Convention in a way conflict with each other. In a, another way, they don't. Now, with that said, let's move on because I want to show you some other parts here. Article 53, and this is probably one of the most important paragraphs in the whole Vienna Convention. It's on page 43. Treaties conflicting with a peremptory norm of international law, just cogents. A treaty is void. Void, meaning it is invalid from the time of conception. It is flat out invalid. It is void if at the time of the conclusion, that is the creation of the treaty, it conflicts with the norm of general international law. Then it goes on to say for purposes of this convention a peremptory norm is a norm that is accepted and recognized by the international community of states as a whole. And here's probably the most important language. As a norm, that is a way of behaving, that is from which no derogation is permitted. No exceptions is what that means in plain language. So Article 53 of the Vienna Convention essentially sets forth this whole notion of the highest form of international law being jus cogens, peremptory norm of international law. And again, what are some of those norms? Genocide, you know, slavery, prohibition against slavery, uh, use of chemical weapons and warfare, um, you know, other matters that rise to that level. There's not a whole bunch of them. And that changes over time, of course. But this is the idea that a treaty is void. So let, you know, we have two countries that are states. Every state possesses the right to enter into a treaty, as we've already seen in the Vienna Convention. But if that treaty, maybe it's two states that have agreed to engage in genocide for a group of people within both of their countries, that treaty is void. Even though the states otherwise would have the legal authority to enter into a treaty, that treaty violates a peremptory norm of international law, and therefore it is invalid. We have the same kind of rule domestically. It would be like if you and I entered into a contract for you to sell me a ton of heroin, or a hit contract, an assassination contract. You know, I'll give you one Bitcoin if you'll take out my brother, something like that. That's a void, that's a void contract, it's illegal. So that's the same kind of idea, only on an international level. Now why is that important? Well, very important. But again, this is the idea that customary law at some level is still the highest form of law. That no treaty can override a peremptory norm. So therefore, a peremptory norm was always going to be the pinnacle, the highest form of international law. <clears throat> now with that said, going back to the very first day of class, what if this is not enforced? So clearly, we see violations of peremptory norms all the time in the world. I mean, awful things happen. What if that's not enforced? Is it still international law? 
I don't really have an answer for that necessarily, but the idea of a peremptory norm is still the highest form, will carry forward throughout international law. Enforcement's another matter. <clears throat> All right, now let me show you something else here. Along with the same theme, Oh, sorry, before I get there, I forgot this article here. Article 60, this is on page 45. Talked about this a few minutes ago, but this is where we see the written language. Termination or suspension of the operation of a treaty as a consequence of its breach. A material breach of a bilateral treaty by one of the parties entitles the other to invoke the breach as ground for terminating the treaty or suspending its operation. What does that mean? That means if we have a contract and you violate the contract, then I can violate it as well. We have the same, law, same rule of contract law in the United States. Actually, most countries do. But here we see it on an international level. This allows a non-breaching state to go ahead and breach if there's already been a breach. <clears throat> Now let's go over to Article 64. Let's see if I can get that to focus a little bit better. All right, Article 64. Emergence of a new peremptory norm of general international law, which is cogens. If a new peremptory norm of general international law emerges, any existing treaty which is in conflict with that norm becomes void and terminates. So I show you this, and why is that important? Again, back to the idea that a peremptory norm, and again, part this is kind of my opinion, but this is also pretty, pretty well true, as far as I've ever seen. A peremptory norm can override a treaty. So a treaty's valid. Maybe you've got a number of different countries that are part of the treaty. And over time, a new peremptory norm emerges, either due to technological changes, uh, you know, maybe biomedical ethical issues emerge as we have technological changes in biomedicine, or different types of weaponry, uh, or whatever. Just over time, we have a new peremptory norm that emerges. That will automatically override a treaty that conflicts with it. So, kind of an interesting concept. Again, this is the idea back to what is the pinnacle? What is the highest form of international law? It really is, regardless of Article 38 of the Court of Justice hierarchy, it really is a peremptory norm, which is customary international law that is agreed to as such. <clears throat> Probably biomedicines, where we're going to see a lot of that going forward. Uh, genetic manipulations, uh, combining, you know, cloning. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things out there. It's going to happen, you know, over the course of the next decade, few decades, where we're going to start seeing how that interplays uh, with countries. So, let's just talk about cloning for a moment. So if a country is not part of a treaty and it's engaging in cloning of humans, other countries essentially have acknowledged that from an ethical, biomedical standpoint, it is a violation as a peremptory norm to clone humans. But that country says, wait, we're not part of that treaty. Or maybe there's not even a treaty. It's just a matter of a peremptory norm. Can the country that is not part of the agreement still be held, in other words, would they still be in violation of international law if it is determined that cloning of a human is a peremptory, violation of a peremptory norm? So under Article 38 of the Vienna Convention, under Article 53 of the Vienna Convention, and then under Article 64 of the Vienna Convention, I would say that yes, if, and probably, I need to kind of rephrase that. When I say cloning, 
non-consensual cloning. So in other words, somebody clones me, I don't know why you do that, but you clone me without my permission. Now, even with permission, ew, you know, huh, sticky area of law. So on an international level, you would make the argument, well, <clears throat> clearly non-consensual cloning is a violation of juice cogens, peremptory norm, perhaps even consensual cloning. And so even if a country is part of a treaty that they agree to engage in cloning or they do it on their own, they could still be determined to be violating international law because it's violation of a peremptory norm. That's the kind of idea I'm talking about here. So the Vienna Convention builds in automatically this idea that law, the law may change, peremptory norms may change, and as those peremptory norms change, they may override a conflicting treaty. You have the same idea, right? Prior to slavery being un unlawful, you know, there were contracts to engage in slavery, and they were enforceable by the courts at that time in various countries. Now, obviously, we would never do that now because it's now a peremptory norm. So any contract to the contrary would be void as a matter of law. <clears throat> so interesting area. Um, that would be a great essay question. Hint, hint. Oh, wait, I missed something. Okay, page 48, article 71. Consequences of the invalidity of a treaty which conflicts with a peremptory norm of general international law. Case of a treaty which is void under article 53, remember article 53 says if a treaty conflicts with peremptory norm, it's void. The parties to the treaty shall, letter A, Eliminate as far as possible the consequences of any act performed in reliance which conflicts, in other words, not engage in that behavior anymore, and B, bring their mutual relations into conformity with the peremptory norm. So in other words, parties to avoid treaty have, one, an obligation not to engage in those actions anymore, and number two, they have an obligation to either modify the treaty so it doesn't conflict, or essentially terminate the treaty as a whole. Furthermore, it releases the parties from any further obligation to perform that treaty as a matter of law. So they will no longer be bound by the treaty that has become void. <clears throat> um, Okay, Article 74 at the bottom here. Diplomatic and consular relations and conclusion of treaties. The severance or absence of diplomatic relations, so in other words, we're kind of seeing this right now in the Ukraine, and withdrawing the embassy and, and whatnot, does not prohibit states from entering into treaties or agreements between those states. Now, it seems kind of obvious, but back to the idea of who has power to enter into a treaty, states, and this is essentially saying it's not a prohibition of the Vienna Convention to continue to negotiate towards a treaty even if you're withdrawn diplomatic relations. Pretty obvious, but uh, happens all the time in the real world. <clears throat> Okay, seems like I'm missing something. Hold on, let me look at my notes real quick. Uh, 